Yeah, one guy, we almost, we were probably about five minutes from coming to blows. Man, I had success lying to women and toying with their minds, man, manipulating them, man. What, what's with this, this straightforward honesty stuff, man? Alan Roger Curry. <laughs> it's an honor to have you on the podcast, man, on At the End of the Tunnel, and to go a little bit into your backstory. So thank you very much for making the time. Thank you for having me, Light. I appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. All right, man. So I typically like to start these conversations off talking about childhood. I know you grew up in Gary. I know you have an older brother. Um, and I know your parents were together when you guys were growing up, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So thinking back to those younger days, um, did you did you have any favorite toys or activities as a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to. Uh... My claim to fame when I was younger was I used to create, I took a, a G.I. Joe doll with the Kung Fu grip and I had a couple other male dolls and I basically performed as like a combination of a voiceover artist and a network <laughs> programming executive because I had this slate of shows, imaginary shows that, and I would do this, it was so funny, I would do this in between commercial, like coming up next on GI Joe, he has another daring adventure with his arch enemy, so-and-so, and I would just, and my brother would just come in the room and look at me and just go, like, what is wrong with my little brother? <laughs> Yeah, I had a, just a slew. I had at least five or six different shows that I would have in, uh, in my bedroom. And I just, you know, talk to myself and play with my toys. And so, yeah. So you later had aspirations to become an actor, but were you thinking of that as a kid? Were you thinking of entertainment and I want to be out in, the, in that world? Yeah, the or first that thing... About? The first thing that sparked my interest, well, it was a couple of things, actually, at least two. Um, one was the success of our hometown heroes, the Jackson Five. That's what made me believe that someone can just make it with hard work. Because honestly, as crazy as this might sound, before the Jackson Five became famous, I thought all celebrities were kind of chosen hmm. and, you know, they had some kind of I don't know, nepotism or some type of connections that allowed them to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Jackson five made media and entertainment industry success real. And then secondly, um, on the recommendation of my one of the friends of my parents, we had this talent agent come to our home when I was little. And my parents were thinking about having my brother and I be child actors in like television commercials. And I just, it, it, ne it didn't work out that way. We, it never happened. But that sparked a fire as far as my interests and ambitions related to the entertainment industry. Mm. I also read this thing about you creating a comic book and selling it to your fellow classmates. Were you an yeah. artist? Yeah, I, I was, uh, my mother was an art teacher. So I guess mm. I picked up some of her DNA. And yeah, I used to both uh, write the stories, uh, do the animation, and then I would sell them to my classmates for anywhere from a nickel to 15 cents. I would go to uh, <laughs> a Xerox machine, copy. That's how I you know, would make copies. And then I would sell them. And interesting enough, my classmates were buying them. Because hmm. I was kind of fresh. I was a big comic book fan. I love both uh, many of the DC superheroes as well as the Marvel superheroes. But... Uh, you know, I didn't see too many that looked like myself. You know, they I think Luke Cage might have been around at that time. Mm -hmm. But other than Luke Cage, there were no so all, all my superheroes were black. 
And uh, I was I had a black version of the Flash. Um, and I tried to create my own unique heroes that didn't have the exact superpowers of already established comic books. But I, if there was one superhero that was similar to an already established was the Flash. I had a black version of the Flash. And uh, he was called Turbo. And uh, yeah, I did that for probably at least three years. So it sounds like as a child, you had a pretty healthy um self-esteem because you have to you know to be a hustler like that you have to believe in yourself you have to believe in what you're doing and when you go out to sell that stuff to your to the other kids you have to be very confident right well yeah it, it did take some confidence and uh but i don't know if my self-esteem was the highest because when i was in elementary school i was chubby <laughs> and, and it's funny it's different than today like i see kids today sadly mm -hmm. that are not just chubby i mean they're like just flat out like obese um and it's funny because when i look at pictures today of when i was in elementary school i look at myself and say i wasn't that fat but a lot of my classmates not well i should say a lot at least a good number of them you know they would call me chub chops and, and fat boy and my mom would always have to give me a pep talk, like, you're not fat, you're just husky. And so that was one thing that, that did kind of keep my self-esteem somewhat suppressed. I had this image that I was just this big fat guy. And, uh, but what balanced that out, most of my classmates considered me the smartest and creative kid in their class. So I would always get a lot of praise from my classmates in, that, in those two areas. How were you with the ladies as a, as a, like a young person, like, you know, in elementary, junior high school, that kind of thing before you matured? <laughs> I was, I was basically like a super shy, introverted, semi-nerd and geek around women from elementary school all the way through really about my freshman high school. I didn't really, you could say, come out of my shell until about my sophomore year in high school, um, I became more confident and more social and just generally better with women, had a couple girlfriends. Well, it, the big turning point, I would say the first turning point was um, my sophomore year. But two years later, my senior year, oh man, huge. But I get into too long a story. What happened, I was trying to make the basketball team Okay. I tried out my junior year, didn't make it. Then I really like the summer before my senior year, I like exercise intensively. I was working out, doing push-ups, working with free weights, doing wind sprints, and just, you know, playing hoops pretty much every day. I got to a point where I could actually dunk at, at the height of 5'10, 5'10 and a half. And, but I still, the bad news is I still didn't make the basketball team my senior year, but my, I had this really chiseled physique. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I had been kind of a guy who always carried at least a few extra pounds, but my senior in high school is when I, probably the first time I became real lean and muscular and women noticed it. And so long story short, I got a boatload of attention from girls my senior in high school more I, I say this i i got i received more attention from girls my senior in high school than my freshman sophomore and junior year combined hmm. what was your um what was your approach like in high school were you modeling any did you have any mentors in that regard your dad sit you down one day and talk to you about life and women and that kind of thing or what was what was your understanding like in that in those days you know, sadly, I didn't have really any conversations with my dad when I was in high school. Um, we had some conversations later on, mm -hmm. probably starting with my early to mid 20s, but in high school, not so much. Now, my mother, she was always preaching to me to present myself as the classy, ultra polite, and well mannered gentlemen 
Um, so yeah, she gave me a lot of advice along those lines, which if you've read my books, you know that that kind of ended up frustrating me a few years later. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I found entering into college at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, I sometimes find myself almost trying too hard to be Mr. Classy Guy and Mr. Gentleman. And it, it the end result was I found myself in many women's friend zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became frustrating to me. So you had a turning point. You saw this, this pornography um this this film with a certain approach <laughs> and it kind of changed your perspective on things can you talk about that <laughs> now like you know it's so funny you, you make me feel convicted because you enunciate that word <laughs> <laughs> pornography <laughs> or porno <laughs> <laughs> oh boy I, I i think i Either consciously or subconsciously, when I reference that film, I always say an adult film uh, as opposed to <laughs> the P word, but you just emphasize. <laughs> but Let yes, ask, it was. I'm going to ask it. No, I'm going to ask it again. I'm going to say adult film. I think that's better anyway. All right. So you saw an adult film that sort of changed your, your perspective on dyna the dynamic between men and women. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, that was, that was, we've been talking about up to this point, turning points. Mm -hmm. That was the first big turning point towards the trajectory to developing my Mo One philosophy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, the summer, about maybe, I don't know, a month or so after I had graduated from high school in 1981, my brother and I were visiting um, some friends of my parents the, my parents were real close with this guy's parents. And by virtue of that, my brother and I were real close to the sons. They had three sons. Um, one son, the oldest son was the same age as my brother. And this was when VHS was fairly new. And so when our parents and his parents stepped out to go somewhere, I can't remember where they went, they left us at the house and he pulled out these VHS adult films and what was interesting he had a unique thing he liked to laugh he treated adult films like comedy he, he looked for everything that was funny mm -hmm. about the films that, that was his motivation whereas you know honestly most guys motivation to watch adult films was to engage <laughs> in self-pleasure and uh but yeah so he pulled out this we watched probably at least three different films that day. And one of them was called Talk Dirty to Me. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that movie, I was just like, wow. Because I had never seen, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, a lot of things had changed. I talk about this in one of my books called The Beta Male Revolution. In, in real simple terms, women had become more comfortable engaging in casual sex, you know, and that type of thing. It wasn't as much of a stigma. So guys were engaging in premarital sex and casual sex when I was young, but I didn't know any guy that was really straightforward about it. Mm -hmm. And this guy played by this legendary adult film actor named John Leslie. He was just really verbally bold and straightforward with the female characters in the film about his desire to engage in a one night stand or weekend fling with them. And it just kind of blew me away because that I would say both in real life and on film, I had never seen a man operate like that. Probably maybe the closest might have been Sean Connery's uh, role as James Bond, he, he was somewhat candid and straightforward, but not like John Leslie. And so anyway, my brother saw me kind of taking mental notes and he immediately said, bro, don't even think about trying this in real life. You'll get slapped. You have a drink thrown in your face. You know, it, you just get a bunch of negative reactions and rejections. He was basically like, yeah, don't, don't even, he said, this is a script reason why he's this guy is succeeding 
using this real ultra straightforward method is because he scripted to be successful. But he essentially said, this will never work in real life. Well, those ended up being infamous last words because I proved them wrong. <laughs> what was it? What were you feeling inside that made you, I mean, obviously you're intelligent enough to know that that's a script and to know that it went the way it went because that's the way it was written. But what made you, what would you feel inside to know that this was, this was meant to be your path to help show other people how to, not that you necessarily knew that fully formed in that moment, but there's something that sparked, that inspired you in that moment. I'm just curious what that would have been. Well, what was fascinating to me watching the movie was not just his verbal candor, mm -hmm. but it was the portrayal of many of the women he seduced. There's a term that my followers say I, I use almost ad nauseum, which is sexual duplicity. Sexual duplicity, mm -hmm. which is in simple terms for your listeners that and viewers, that means if a woman is, is constantly presenting herself in public as the innocent, wholesome, prudish or semi-prudish, monogamy-oriented good girl, but then behind closed doors, she got a totally different side there that's more naughty, more kinky, possibly more promiscuous and polyamorous, that would mean she's sexually duplicitous. Mm -hmm. And that movie, for me, was the first movie where I saw sexual sexual duplicity in action, because he he would have situations where unlike like most adult films I had seen before then, although I hadn't seen too many, it seemed like the woman was already interested in the guy. The guy didn't really have to do any type of like persuasion to get the woman in bed. Whereas John Leslie's character of Jack. He always had to do some degree of persuasion and verbal seduction to get women to agree to have casual sex with him. And they would usually initially give him, you know, an adverse reaction, somewhat of a negative response. But then he was able to sway that in his favor. And I just found that fascinating on both ends. I found it fascinating that he had the talent to get a woman to change her mind, even though, again, as you mentioned, deep down, I knew it was scripted. And then on the flip side, it really freaked me out that the I, I found myself going, okay, so women will fake like they're turned off by your blunt sex talk when they're really not. That was a major epiphany on my head. I, I had that really had my wheels turned into my head. That aspect right there, I was like, so there are women that will fake a negative reaction. But really, they're turned on by this real, you know, bold, explicit sex talk. And so I didn't make a change overnight, but you can say over roughly the next three years, I kept marinating over that. I kept marinating over that. And then another, you could say, turning point was fast forward three years later, it was um, towards the end of my third year at Indiana University. I was having a conversation with these three women who were members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And we got to talking about just dating and relationships in general. And then at one point they said, Alan, can we pick your brain over something? I said, sure. And, they, and one of them said, Alan, why do men do this thing where they'll give you the misleading impression that they want a long-term relationship with you but then after you have sex with them two times, three times, five times, 10 times, all of a sudden you just don't hear from them again. I said, oh, that's, that's easy. I said, these are guys who really deep down, they just wanted to engage in casual sex with you, but they didn't have the heart or courage to tell you that straightforwardly. So they basically misled you and, and manipulated you. And they were really frustrated by that. They said, well, why? I mean, why would they do it? How come, how come they won't be straightforward about Because, Alan, I hope you know, women, we get into casual sex too. And that was funny when she said that because that was at least partially surprising to me. 
Because way back at this point, this was the early 80s. I didn't think women were enthusiastic about engaging in casual sex. Unless they were just, you know, had a solidified reputation for being highly promiscuous. But other than that, I didn't think women really were down to engage in casual sex. But these three AKAs, they let me know. They said, they basically went on to say, we have the same delineations that of, of men that you guys have of women. For example, they said, you guys have certain women you look at as just, can, can I curse on your show? As PG? Yeah, go for it. No, go for yeah. it. She said, Be yourself. you guys have um, women you look at as just fuck buddy material. Am I correct? I said, yeah. And then you have other women that you look at as more long-term girlfriend, maybe even future wife material. Am I correct? I said, exactly. She said, well, see, us women, we have the same delineations. There's some guys, we look at them and say, oh, he's sexy. I wouldn't mind having a roll in the hay with him for a, a night, two nights, three nights. But at the same time, they would be like, that guy, we, we would say to ourselves, we don't want him as a boyfriend or as a husband, but just as a satisfying lover for a few days or maybe a couple of weeks or so, sure. Then we have other guys that we look at as long-term boyfriend slash future husband material. So they went on again to make the argument that we don't understand why men go as far as to be dishonest, disingenuous, misleading, manipulative with us, because they never know. If they were straightforward with us, they have no idea that many of us would reciprocate their sexual desires and interests. And of course, that made me reference Talk Dirty to Me and the sequel, I saw the sequel, Talk Dirty to Me Part Two. So yeah, in that conversation, I started thinking about those two, what I learned from those two movies. So then the next thing that happened, I, I went back to my fraternity house. I'm a member of Cap Alpha Psi fraternity. And I kind of did an informal survey of some of my fraternity brothers. I would ask them, I say, fellas, when you meet a woman that you know you pretty much just want casual sex with, you have no real desire to be in a long-term relationship with these women. Are you straightforward about that with them? Or do you like, you know, make attempts to mislead them and manipulate them? And they all were like, come on, Alan. You can't be straightforward. With, you can't just go up to a woman and be like, hey, Tanya, I have no interest in being your boyfriend. I just want to fuck you for the next two weeks. You down? They were like, no, that, you're going to get slapped. You're going to get cursed out. You're going to have drinks. Thrown in. You can't do that. And I was like, why can't you? And they, they treated me like I was just goofy. They were like, Alan, what have you been drinking, dude? You, you cannot, I swear to God, you cannot go up to a woman and straightforwardly let her know in the very first conversation that all you want from her is just say a, a few episodes of casual sex. And I, I kept saying, I beg to differ. So they said, okay, next party we have, show me. Let's see this, this straightforward style you got that you, you, you claim will work and be effective. We want to see this because we're going to be standing a few feet away laughing at you. And long story short, I proved them all wrong. I had them all like, whoa. They started nicknaming it the Jedi mind trick. They said, oh man, Alan, they would tell other Fredbro, they say, hey man, Alan got this Jedi mind trick, man, where he goes up to women and he says really like bold, straightforward, sexually explicit stuff to them. And at first they have somewhat of a negative reaction, but then he uses his personality to just charm them. And next thing you know, they're like smiling and giggling and giving him their phone number. Man, this dude is on to something. So can you, can you just walk us through like what they would have seen at one of those parties when you were first iterating the, uh, the, you didn't have a name for it at the time, probably, but yeah, when you were first iterating this this concept. Yeah, what I, I, a couple of examples, like say at the at the cabin party was, I went up to a woman, I went up to a, one one of the women, I mm -hmm. approached that night, and I said, "You looking good in that outfit?" And she said, "Thank you." I said, "You know what? We need to get together sometime in the next, I don't know, week or two. And she said, "Why?" I said, because I want to fuck you. And she went, what? <laughs> excuse me? And I said, your excuse? 
She said, I don't believe you just said that. I said, yes, you do. You believe I said it. I said, you're a sexy woman. I can tell by the way you look at me that you're attracted to me. We need to get together and fuck. No attachments, no monogamous commitments, just straight up fuck. And the woman was like, wow, wow, wow. I never knew you were like this. I thought you were so much more of like a, a gentleman. I, I never knew you, you talked to women like this. I said, we all got different sides to our personality. I said, so are you telling me you're not interested? If you're not interested, I'll walk away and leave you alone. And see, I do that with a lot of women. I call that my, my followers know, I call this, I, the, I dare you to reject me concept. Mm. You know, I always actually see a lot of men, and we can get into that a little later, but a lot of men, because of the advice of conventional PUAs, they try to always prevent and avoid rejection. Whereas mm -hmm. I would run up to it head on. I would always say something to the effect of, uh, when I would converse with a woman, I would always say something to the effect of, are you not interested? Because if you are, I'll end the conversation right now. And that's what I did to one of the women at that Kappa party. I said, if you're not interested, I'll leave you alone right now. And she didn't end the conversation. She just kind of looked at me and she said, so you want to fuck me? Huh? I said, I very much want to fuck you. Then I moved in closer and I stopped talking in her left ear. I said, I want to fuck the shit out of you. And I just started saying a whole bunch of X-rated dirty talk. And to my pleasant surprise, she started getting turned on. She was like, oh, oh. Oh, this is hot. This is hot. She said, you going to come over tomorrow? I said, yeah, I'll come over tomorrow. So some of my frat brothers were observing this from like, I don't know, three, four feet away. And they mm -hmm. saw her change. They saw mm -hmm. how she initially looked like she, you know, she was having a, giving me a negative reaction. Then the next thing they saw her smiling and giving me her number. And they were like, like, wow. And then I had a similar conversation with at least, I want to say at least two more women at that same party. And the same thing happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the other two women, they did essentially the same thing. I approached them. I first usually would give them a compliment like, man, what's up, Linda? You enjoying yourself at the party? And then Linda would say, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, Linda, you know, you got one of the nicest, roundest, juiciest looking asses on this entire campus. You probably hear that a lot. And then Linda was like, oh, Alan, you're so bad. You're so naughty. I can't believe you just said that. I said, oh, I said that because I want to fuck you. And then Linda was like, what? <laughs> did you just, did you? I said, yes, I said it. So you just thought, you, you're not going to apologize for saying that? I said, why should I apologize for telling you the truth? You got a big, round, juicy ass. I want to fuck the shit out of you. Doggy style, preferably. And Linda was like, oh, my God, Alan, you need to stop. You need to stop. And again, what did I do? I said, okay, Linda, look me dead in my eyes and tell me you don't want me to fuck you. If you look me dead in my eyes and tell me you want you don't want me to fuck you uh, in this conversation right now and go about my way. And Linda didn't end the conversation. She said, well... You know, I do find you handsome, Alan. Then I leaned closer. I said, tell me that again. She said, I do find you handsome. And then I had this habit of saying, say it again, which is actually the title of one of my books. I said, say it again. She said, I think you're handsome. Then I said, tell me that you want me to fuck you. And first she said, Alan, I can't. I don't know. I can't say it. I don't know. I said, you can say it. Say, it. say it. Alan, I want you to fuck me. And she said, Alan, I want you to fuck me. I said, say it again. She said, Alan, I want you to fuck me. And then we, and so again, I had some frat brothers watching that. And they was just like, I'll be damned. So the next thing that happened, that was during uh, the 84, 85 academic year at IU. Then that following year, my, bro, my older brother, Steven, he was at a satellite campus of IU in Gary called Indiana University Northwest in Gary, Indiana. And he transferred down to the Bloomington campus. And so when he came down, a lot of my front brothers 
when they ran into him, they would say, oh, so you Ellen's br brother, Steven. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, man, your brother, man, he a trip, man. And Steven would be like, what, what are you talking about? They'd be like, man, your brother, Alan, man, he is by far the most verbally bold, straightforwardly honest dude when he comes to talking to women, probably on the entire campus of any university, man. I mean, this dude, he never misses words. It, as expected, my brother also referenced the Talk Dirty. He knew I'd watch those movies. So he said, hey, man, I'm hearing you using that Talk Dirty stuff in real life. And I said, yep. And he said, and according to your front brothers, it's working for you. I said, yep. And he was like, get out of here. I don't believe that. So you actually like just going up to women and like in the first two to three minutes of the conversation, you let women know you, you want to casually fuck them. I said, yep. And he was basically like skeptical. He's like, get out of here. But then he ended up, we ended up going to a grocery store one night in June of 1986. I still remember like it was yesterday. And I ain't gonna, I'll skip over Miss Lane's details, but in a nutshell, I was mo one with a woman. She ended up performing oral sex on me. He was an eyewitness to it because we were in her car and he was like two spaces away in his car and he could see her head bobbing up and down. And that was the night, that was a game changer definitely for my brother because that's when he first suggested that I put it on paper. He said, bro, bro. Bro, I remember he just kept saying, bro, over again. He said, bro, bro, man, if you getting results like this from this talk dirty method you're using, he said, oh, man, you got to put this on paper, bro. You got to put this on paper, man. This is like phenomenal, man. And I kind of was playing it down. I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know about putting it on paper. He's like, no, seriously, man, I think you can help some guys, particularly guys that are maybe shy and introverted and just don't have the same level of courage that you do. He said, man, I think you can help guys like that, man. I mean, that's like amazing that that works in real life. Mm. And yeah. So I have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> in those three years in between you um, watching that adult film and then you trying out your tactics at this party, the, did, did you develop the sort of script that you were essentially using um, where you say it again and, you know, you're excused and these kinds of lines? Um, and, or did you like crash and burn a lot in the beginning? And then also, I want you to talk about your zero tolerance for small talk. And, and when did that start? Because <laughs> it, it's it feels like that's related to your your attraction to this very straightforward approach. I'm glad you brought that up, like because I've told guys over the years that my development of my more one philosophy was not solely and specifically about trying to get laid. And mm -hmm. that kind of surprises a lot of guys and throws a lot of guys off, but it's the truth. Um, it was actually more so the flip why over those three years, which would be my first three years at any university, I found myself engaging in a lot of lengthy, entertaining conversations with women, usually that center around fluff talk, chit chat, small talk. And I would, I would always naively think that was going to lead to me making out with women and ultimately having sex with them. But I just found myself getting friend zone by the vast majority of those women. And it would always make me feel angry. Like say I met a woman, Michelle, and I engaged in like a, a, a 45 minute, hour long, hour and a half long, friendly and flirtatious conversation with her, but it didn't lead to me make, having sex with her or at minimum even making out with her. I would feel angry. I ain't gonna lie. I, I would feel just flat out angry and regretful like, man, that conversation was a waste of time. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I start wanting to be more one, even though I did look at identifying the women who wanted to have sex with me as you could say the frosting on the cake, but the cake itself was I wanted to identify the women 
who were not interested in having sex with me. What I later began to refer to as the manipulative time wasters. That's who I wanted to identify the quickest was women who had this friendly, flirtatious nature about them, but really they weren't interested in actually having sex. So when I start being, you know, what I later referred to as my one behavior, that was always my number one objective. If I was engaging in a conversation, I was saying myself, to myself, okay, this woman seems very friendly towards me. She seems to one degree or another flirtatious towards me. But how do I know that's, that's, that's real, that it's going to lead to something? So I'm just going to straightforwardly let this woman know, hey, are we fucking? Because if we're not, I'm going to end the conversation. And that mm-hmm. later related to my philosophy of uh, no free attention. Because my, my general attitude used to be, if you're not going to give me free access to your sexual companionship, I'm not going to give you free access to my non-sexual companionship and entertaining conversation. And uh, so, yeah, but it was during those three years, my first three years at IU, I had just a lot of frustrating experiences related to being friend zone. And so I, I, I wouldn't say I thought too hard pre-planned like any pre-rehearsed scripts. Um, I just really, number one, I studied, like Kobe talked about how he used to study both Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. And he incorporated what he saw into his game. And then, of course, he developed his own style. I did the same thing with John Leslie's character of Jack and Talk Dirty to Me and Talk Dirty to Me Part Two. I mean, I literally, I studied every nuance in his voice, his facial expressions, everything. In those two movies, I would watch them over and over and over again. Like I would just study how he would look at women, use his eyes and look at women. So by the time I started doing it myself in real life, I felt prepared because I had studied him so well. So you could say my first, I don't know, two or three years being my one with women, I was essentially just emulating what I saw John Leslie do as his character of Jack and Talk Dirty to Me and Talk Dirty to Me Part Two. Can you define uh, mode one? for the listeners. Yeah, sure. Um, And uh, I finally gave my behavior and approach a title in October of 1990 after an interaction with one of my mother's former students. And I came back home. Wait, wait, you gotta tell that story. That's a great story. Okay, yeah, I, uh, one night it was, I think specifically, I want to say it was the second Thursday in October in 1990, whatever that date is. Because I remember, yeah, it was on a Thursday, and I believe it was the second Thursday in October of 1990. It was raining, uh, and I was uh, coming home. I lived in a neighborhood on the far northeast side called Miller Beach, which is, by most Gary residents, that's the neighborhood that's considered arguably the most affluent neighborhood in Gary, Indiana. So I was coming from the west side, headed back towards east. And when you got one of the main thoroughfares in Gary, Indiana is Broadway. So when I got to Fifth Avenue and Broadway, I happened to notice that one of my mother's former students was standing on the corner with a little umbrella above her head. And so I rolled down the window. I said, because I knew she was at the bus stop that goes to Miller Beach. So I said, you headed towards Miller, I would assume. And she looked at me like, I don't know you. And I, and I said, I said, does the name Mildred Curry ring a bell? And she said, oh my God, Mrs. Curry, I love her. I love her. She was my teacher. I said, well, I'm her son. She said, oh, okay. And I said, if, if, you, know, if you want to ride, I'm willing to give it to you. But uh, you know, if not, you can you know, wait for the bus. She said, no, no, I'll take the ride. So she got in the car. And within a minute or two, she started engaging in all this small talk with me. She started talking about her day. Then she transitioned and talked about some gossip that involved a couple of her girlfriends. 
And honestly, I just started tuning out. I wasn't interested. And she she was perceptive enough to pick up on that. So <laughs> two minutes into the conversation, she just looked at me. She said, you look like you're not even listening to what I'm saying. You're like in your own world. Now, the normal old gentleman, Alan Roger Curry, would have been pleasantly phony and said, oh, no, I'm listening. Sure, continue. Let me hear this, these stories about your girlfriends. But at this point, I had become so real and authentic that, yeah, I just told her, I said, I'm going to be honest with you. Let's call her Janelle. I said, Janelle, I don't give a fuck about none of the stuff you're talking about. And she just was like, well, damn. Wow. Tell me how you really feel. I said, I'm just being real. I don't, I don't, I don't give a damn about this gossipy stuff you're talking about. She said, okay, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, because she had on these black leggings, like we used to come back in the day, bicycle pants. And they were real tight and form fitting, and she had a pretty nice body. And I said, Janelle, the number one thing on my mind is sliding down them tight leggings, bicycle pants you got on. And just bending you over and fucking the shit out of you, doggy style. And she said, What? <laughs> what? Are you, did you just really say that? I said, Yeah, I said it. Don't, you know, get all these theatrics, because that's all they are. That response right there is just theatrics. You're not in total shock and disbelief over what I said. You know when men look at that nice, round, juicy ass of yours that they're thinking about fucking you. You know that. Don't play that role with me. And then she just got quiet and stared out the passenger window. Like she, it was like about a four or five minute stretch where she just wouldn't say anything, good or bad. She just looked out the window. And then when we got to this intersection where there's this McDonald's in the Miller Beach area, Right behind this McDonald's was this uh, motel. And she said, Alan, if you don't mind, could you pull into the parking lot of the motel so we can have a little chat? I said, sure. So then she just looks at me. And she says, okay, I'm going to confess. I said, okay. She said, I'm very turned on right now. <laughs> And I said, truthfully, I'm, I'm not too surprised by that confession. I said, that's what I expected. And she said, really? I said, really? She said, yeah, I'm very turned on. She said, so how did you become this way? A lot of women do that. They want to know. When you're that verbally bold, a lot of women want to know your backstory, your origin story. <laughs> and she was like, like, how long have you been this way? And, you know, I didn't go into too many details. I just said, you know, for at least five years, I've just been straight to the point with women. And then she went on to give me some insight. She said, well, I'm going to let you know this, Alan. This is something most women won't be honest with you about. But she said, us women, if I had to generalize all of us, as you kind of alluded to yourself, we know as soon as a man is friendly with us or flirtatious with us, we know he ultimately wants to get in our pants. That's not like rocket science for us. We know pretty much all heterosexual men want to get in our pants if they find us physically attractive. But she said, here's the thing, though. We, we tend to assume that virtually none of them are going to be bold and straightforward like you just were with me. Hmm. We tend to assume that you're going to ask us out on two or three dates, act like you want to be in a, a long-term relationship with us, uh, maybe buy us something like a little bracelet or uh, a neck chain. Um, Basically, just try to bullshit your way into our pants. That's what most of us women tend to assume. That's, that's what we expect from men, is for men to essentially try to bullshit their way into our pants. And once men do that, sometimes we recognize it early and just 
you know, don't mess with the guy. Or if we're really attracted to the guy, we might do a little bit of game plan ourselves. But we only tend to feel like maybe only two to three percent of men we meet are going to be like you. I just going to like cut through the bullshit, be like, yo, I'm attracted to you. Think you're sexy. We need to fuck. And she said, if we're attracted to you, that is a huge turn on. And I said, well, honestly, Janelle, I already knew that. <laughs> I've already had my experiences that have confirmed that for me. She said, yeah, it's, it's a huge turn on when a guy is really, really bold and straight to the point. Now, honestly, if we're not attracted to you, it could probably have the opposite um, result. You know, we'll be totally turned off. But even in that situation, at least we know we're not going to waste time. So even if a guy I'm not attracted to, I would still prefer to be straightforward. So I can just very quickly tell him I'm not interested and neither one of us waste each other's time. But she said, but yeah, if we're attracted to the guy, oh, that she said, that's, that's much more of a turn on than if a guy does the conventional, you know, basically try to manipulate his way into our pants. And uh, then the key thing that sparked me coming up with Mo One, she said, see, your bold approach is representative of what women want to hear but out of a man's mouth, but don't expect to hear. And I hmm. said, can you repeat that? She said, <laughs> what your bold, straightforward style is representative of what most women want to hear come out of a man's mouth but they don't expect to hear it. And I don't know if you'll be able to relate to this, but I think you probably will, because I think all, most human beings probably experience something like this in their minds, but it's like my mind, figuratively speaking, like took like a graphic arts pen or something and start drawing this quadrant in my head and um, in the lower left quadrant, I had what women want to hear, but don't expect to hear. Then as we continue to talk, I filled out in my head, the top left quadrant, which had what women want to hear and also expect to hear. Then I had, and in, in the top right quadrant, what women don't want to hear, but expect to hear. And then finally, in the lower right quadrant, I have what women neither want to hear or expect to hear. And I, I became so fascinated with when they expand on this, these four quadrants that she, because she got to a point, she wanted me to fuck her in the car, mm. in the parking lot. And believe it or not, I was like, yeah, yeah, let, let, let's get together like in a couple of days. And she was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go home. I got to put this on paper. I got it. And she was like, are you serious? You do all this bold sex talk with me and you're talking about you want to postpone it? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I just saying, I ain't trying to do this right now. I got to go home. And she was like, okay. And so I took her home and my brother brings us up at least once every two years. He said, man, I, I still remember the first time you told me about uh, put my one on paper, you put it on a napkin. You put these four quadrants on a napkin. And I sure did. I, that was the first place because I couldn't find a piece of printing paper. So the first thing I grabbed is just a napkin. And I wrote this quadrant, everything I already told you. I had all the four quadrants. And then later, I used what most people never use anymore in modern technology days, a typewriter. I actually put a sheet of paper in a typewriter and I typed out the quadrant. And at first, I called each of the quadrants category one. I had category one, category two, category three, and category number four. And then later, I, I changed it to mode one, mode two, mode three, and mode four. So the four modes, are, I get it just each. Mode one is, again, simply very confident, verbally bold, straightforward, honesty with women. Um, you let them know exactly why you're really conversing with them and why you really want to share their company in the near future. Mode two. Mode two is when you might be fairly honest, but for the most part, you're more polite, 
cautious and vague and ambiguous. You don't want to just straightforwardly tell women that you want to have sex with them or more specifically casual sex. You kind of drop hints and use sexual innuendo and again, just be vague and ambiguous about it. Mode three is when you're just, in worst case scenario, just totally a verbal coward. Like you're scared to even approach women and initiate a conversation with them. And at minimum, when you're mode three, you tend to be very dishonest, disingenuous, misleading, and manipulative when it comes to communicating your true desires, interests, and thoughts to a woman. And mode four is almost when you approach a woman with the anticipation of her rejecting you or being somewhat of a, for lack of a better word, a bitch. So you start off negative. It, Mo four is almost very similar to Mo. It's like, the, I call it light Harley, the evil twin of Mo one. Mm-hmm. When you're Mo four, you are straightforward as if you were Mo one, but you have these angry undertones and even somewhat misogynistic undertones in your communication style. So those are the four modes. So prior to that experience, you'd never actually written anything down. You hadn't even really thought about it beyond what became mode one. You just knew that you had this approach, this straightforward approach that was working for you for five years. Mm-hmm. What were some of the downsides? What were some of the, the negatives that you experienced over those five years of, of developing this approach? Um, the main negative I was saying had to do with social stratification, particularly in the, in the, in the, in the Black community. In mm-hmm. more blunt terms, I would have certain men, probably even more so than the women, even though I had a few women, but I had a lot of men that would basically end up saying to me in so many words, Alan, you're more or less from the bougie class, man. And, and bougie brothers and sisters don't talk like that to each other. That's that's for like street types. So they would try to make me feel guilty and pass judgment and basically say, Alan, you come from too good a family, you know, middle class, upper middle class type family to be talking to women like that. That's crass. That's disrespectful. Did you develop a reputation? Did did, did your mom or dad find out that, you know, Alan's running around (laughs) saying he wants to have sex with women and that kind of thing? Uh, not immediately. No, okay. no, actually they didn't, they didn't actually didn't find out until I left Los Angeles and came back to the Midwest, which was in 2000. Mm. Um, my father found out first cause my brother told him he, he, he basically he was having a conversation with my father and he told him he was trying to encourage me to write a book about it. And mm. He said that my dad asked him, like, book about what? He said, oh, Alan got this real bold, straightforward approach he uses with women. And uh, blah, 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 blah. And my father's like, okay, I'll be curious to read that. And uh, yeah, he read, the, f- the first time he read a draft was in, uh, I think, 1997. That's when my father first read a draft to Mo one. And my you read the pamphlet, for, the 26 page pamphlet, or was it a no? I well, kind of yes, and I had expanded it by then because, yeah, you, you've been doing your homework. Yeah, my first <laughs> thing was a, a yeah, about a 30 page pamphlet mm-hmm. that my brother encouraged me to write when I was living in Los Angeles and he was living in San Diego. And then I just kept tweaking it like at least once or twice a year after that, I would tweak it like basically add some more content to it. And I, the first copyrighted version, first time I, I, I submitted a copyright was in November 1997. And that was the version that my father first read. And uh, so before we like, get into that, um, mm-hmm. I'm just so you're, an econ- you're, you're you got a degree in economics. Mm-hmm. You were in an MBA program. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where you saw your life going, but do you ever think at that time? In the, in the early 90s that you would basically make a living or create a path out of this mode one philosophy that you were 
developing. Did that ever occur to you? Or do you just think this is kind of probably going to be a hobby and I'll show some of my friends how to do this, maybe write a little book or something and sell it to a few people like I did with the comic books as a kid. What was your thought about that? Yeah, absolutely not. Had no, <laughs> had no realistic thought of becoming a dating advice book author or a dating coach at that time. My focus, starting with summer of 1986, all the way up until probably the late 90s, my career focus was the entertainment industry. I used to pursue an acting career in the mid to late 80s. I used to do local, regional, and I even did like two or three national TV commercials. I actually used to be a print model when I was in my 20s. I used to do like those Sears ads and type things. And um, comedy. Then I did, yeah, I did stand up for, I only did that for about maybe 15 months in 89 and 90. Yeah, I was a stand-up comic in the Chicago area. Then um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I turned to screenwriting. I wanted to be a screenwriter and filmmaker. So anyway, yeah, all my focus was on the entertainment. Industry. I wanted to make it in the entertainment industry. Excuse me. And my brother, you know, to his credit, at the time I found it annoying, but of course now I give him all the credit in the world. He just kept bugging me. Like every year he would bring that up. He would say, man, you really need to get this mall one going. Like after he got the reaction from some of the guys at his workplace, he, that, that pamphlet I created, he gave it to about 10 guys and about four or five of the guys immediately said, this is too ballsy for me. I can't do this. I don't think I could pull this off. But the other five or six guys, they all within three to four weeks after reading the pamphlet, they experienced some more one success with some women. So they came back to him like, dude, your brother need to turn this into a, a, a you know, a full-fledged book, man. This stuff is gold, man. This stuff is gold. And so he was relaying all that feedback to me. He was like, bro, he said, man, I think you on to something, man. I think you on to something. And honestly, I kept brushing it off. I, it was like an afterthought to me. Cause again, I was all about, I want to be a big time, film feature film director feature film screenwriter even possibly a feature film actor that's all that was on my mind in the 90s but he yeah he just kept bugging me and then um the next major turning point was in in may of a couple of weeks before memorial day in 1999 that's when i made it into a full ebook because i had mm -hmm. found out either earlier that year or in late 1998 about the concept of an ebook because that was fairly new at that time. And I created an ebook. Basically, it was just a PDF file. Um, and I made it available to the general public via the internet on different like blog sites and message boards and discussion forums. And then guys would end up reading it and start singing the praises of it. And slowly but surely, you know, I start gaining more notoriety in what's now known as the Manosphere. What were you selling it for back then? Do you remember? I, believe it or not, you know, this is going to blow you away. Like, initially, I gave it away hmm. for like about two years. Some people find that hard to believe. But yeah, for about two years, starting with mid-May of 1999 until about late August early September of 2001, I actually used to just give it away. And then uh, my older brother called me crazy for doing that. And this other guy who's now a dating advisor named Ron Wills, I connected with him through the internet. And he was next to my brother. He also said, he said, man, no way you should be giving this away for free. You need to be selling this. And uh, so that's when I started selling it. And I, yeah, I initially sold it, I think, for uh, $9.99. So when did Hitch come out? Because that was sort of like, I guess, uh, when the idea of a dating coach sort of hit, you know, that critical mass, people didn't know that that was even a, a career path exactly. for some mm -hmm. people. Um, and how did that influence you? 2005, yeah. That's, that's when my brother, you know, um, 
Because when I left Los Angeles, it was because my father, sadly, he had a he had a major stroke, and he ended mm-hmm. up passing away in March of 2002. And my mother, she had her own ailments. And anyway, my main objective was I wanted to have a home based business. But actually, both my brother and I, because he he had moved from South Carolina back home, I moved from Los Angeles back home. And we both, because we felt like if we get a nine to five job, that almost defeats the purpose because, you know, we'll be away from my mom most of the day. So anyway, my brother, when that movie came out, um, he said, man, this is what you need to be. Well, actually, if I can rewind for a second, my brother suggested I become a dating coach technically, even like you said, when dating coaching was even a thing. There was another movie that sparked my brother that suggested to me a movie. I don't know if you ever saw this movie like called Swingers with John Favreau and Vince Vaughn. Yeah, yeah. it's one of the movies you recommended as as a, a, a example of mode one. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. when when my brother, he saw it first before me and then we ended up seeing it together. But that's actually when my brother first suggested that I should be doing the dating coaching thing because he felt like. Vince Vaughn's character was almost an informal dating coach. And so that was the first time he made mention of it. But then five times more so was when Hitch came out. He said, bro, he said, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. He said, this is you. He said, you are already essentially the real life Hitch. He -hmm. said, whether you realize or not, agree with it or not, accept it or not, you are already the real life Hitch. He said, man, you need to just make a go of this, man. He said, I really feel like this is your destiny. And I said, you think so? He said, dude, this is your destiny, bro. This is what you, he basically said, this is your calling. Interesting about Hitch is, I don't remember Hitch being very mode one. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. (laughs) He wasn't. And actually, if I recall, that's one of the things I told my brother. I said, well, I wouldn't call myself the real life Hitch because Hitch, I would say he's probably more mold too. Right. Because, you know, he had that one scene where he told, tells one guy, he said, I'm not really into giving advice on how to hit it and quit it. He said, I'm about giving advice that leads to, you know, relationships and marriage. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I told that to my brother. I said, you know, I don't know if I would go with the nickname, the real life Hitch, because I said, Hitch, yeah, he's more about, you know, long-term romance and marriage. And he, he, my brother, he got frustrated with it. He's like, dude, you're being technical now. And I'm just saying, man, you need, you're in a position where you can create a career, earning an income, giving guys helpful advice. That's it. Okay. Mode one is not something you can turn off, right? Once you turn it on and you start having these experiences, it just, it's, that's how you become that's your mode of operation. So as you're in LA and you're going through the whole acting, you know, scene and you're working for NBC and all that, are you using mode one in life when you're going for auditions and when you're, you know, are you just like saying exactly what's on your mind or how, how, do, how do you navigate just life in general as a mode one aficionado? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Mike. Um, I would probably have to say in full disclosure, no, I wasn't always mold one 100% of the time in all aspects of my life. Mm-hmm. Even when it came to dealing with women, I had some, reg- I've told clients that I've had some regressions along the way. There's been at least a handful of times where if only for like a week or two, I would regress back into being mold two. And it's funny, a lot of those, what I would call mold two regressions, were provoked about what I was talking about earlier, what I was alluding to earlier about guys putting in my ear, like, you know, you're from a good family. You don't want to sh- put shame on your parents' reputation by talking to women this way and blah, 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 blah. But then I just reached a point where I said, well, shoot, so you want me to just be pleasantly phony and full of shit for the rest of my life when talking <laughs> to women? Now, I admit it was more challenging when you get away from the realm of dating relationships, like say in the workplace, I was erratic. Sometimes I was very straightforward in the workplace. 
Sometimes that benefited me. Sometimes it led to me getting fired, <laughs> honestly. Um, and um, with my relationships with some close friends, close male friends, uh, family members, I became more outspoken and straight to the point. And sometimes that led to, you know, some bruised egos and hurt feelings. But in the long run, I thought it was to the benefit. Yeah, I just don't like to maintain any relationship or friendship with somebody that's like just phony. Uh, I just, that makes me cringe. So talk about um, the importance of askmen.com on your sort of public persona as this the the new the real life hitch or whatever whatever you're you're, you're being called in those days because that that went on for a little while right isn't that how you kind of yeah i was on became... askman.com message board for about four years um mm -hmm. i want to say from like november of 2002 to about august or september of 2006 and uh, yeah that was the first internet platform that really helped me gain some degree of notoriety and, and my book start being talked about among a lot of men because I quickly became a controversial figure. I got banned from that, that message board seven times, which was a record at the time. Over what? Because it wasn't so much related to my Mo One content as much as the content that came later in my book the possibility of sex and more recently no free attention you know for your listeners and viewers i have uh five archetypes in case they don't own my books that i discuss and that would be women who i categorize as reciprocators which are mm -hmm. women and once you let them know you're interested in having sex they'll immediately and enthusiastically say yeah i'm down to rejectors which is just the opposite. Once you let them know what your desires, interests are, they'll tell you straightforwardly that they're not interested. Then the three trickier types is the wholesome pretender. That's a woman that deep down has what I call an inner slut side or inner kinky freak side, a naughty side simply, but she doesn't like to present that to the general public. She wants to always maintain an image as a wholesome monogamy oriented good girl. So she's gonna always resist initially, a wholesome pretender. Uh, particularly if, if you propose in casual sex as opposed to long-term relationship sex. Similar to the wholesome pretender is what I call an erotic hypocrite. That's basically a more pretentious, more materialistic and more antagonistic and argumentative variation of a wholesome pretender. She's gonna really try to test your, your backbone and see if you really got thick skin. And, uh, I mentioned earlier the manipulative time waster. That's a woman who has no interest in being physically or sexually intimate with you, but she loves your non-sexual attention and companionship, your platonic companionship. And, and in addition, sometimes she wants to take advantage of you financially. So given those uh, five archetypes, the manipulative time waster I'm sorry. I just had a brain fart. What led me to my archetypes? You asked me a really. Uh, we were just talking about uh, one turning on and off and then um, in, in real life. And then uh, we talked about askmen.com. Askmen.com. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I know what it was now. I know what it was now. You asked yeah. me, I, I mentioned that I, I was banned seven times. Right. And you said, what were you talking about that provoked you to get banned? Yeah. Um, my book, Ooh, Say It Again, is primarily about the wholesome pretenders and erotic hypocrites and how to identify them and ultimately seduce them. Then my mm -hmm. book, The Possibility of Sex and No Free Attention, is more so about the manipulative time wasters. Mm -hmm. and now, I didn't come out with the poss possibility of sex until October of 2012, but I was talking about almost everything in that book as far back as the 1990s in early 2000s. So I used to talk about man, women who I felt were manipulative time wasters and the signs, I would tell guys the signs to look out for. And women hated that. They hated that. 
They did not. It was funny because I had a lot of women on askman.com that didn't have a problem with my Mo One philosophy, even what I call my Mo One hardcore, which involves more X-rated, you know, explicit language. But when it came to me talking about women who were manipulative and will pretend to be interested in you <clears throat> when they're really not, women got upset about that content. They did not like it. Because basically I was revealing their, their, you could say their manipulative head games playbook. Mm. And they didn't want it revealed. You, you learned about no free attention. And I know you, you understood the concept, but you got that, that phrase out, that phrase from a job that you were working from one of your coworkers. What was that? What was that moment? That anecdote? Yeah. Yeah. I used to work uh, in, in downtown Chicago in uh, 1988. And there was this guy who worked with me named Anthony. And uh, he was, he kind of physically, he resembled Charlie Murphy. He looked like he could be one of the Murphy brothers. <laughs> yeah, he looked like he could be Eddie Murphy's brother or first cousin. And, but he was really, like, he, he was really standoffish. And I noticed because he was, pretty standoffish. A lot of the women I work with would always be at his cubicle, almost like begging him to give them some attention and conversation. And so one day we were in the break room and I just laid hardly said, I said, hey brother, what's happening? I said, I'm Alan, man. I said, what's your secret? And we had never conversed before. So initially, Initially, he turned around and looked at me in the break room like, like, bro, I don't know you. Like, why are you talking to me? I don't know you. And uh, so I kind of ignored his negative reaction. I just asked him again. I said, bro, man, what's your secret? And then he paused. He just kind of looked at me, almost like glared at me for a minute or so. And then he finally said, what are you talking about? And I said, man, I noticed that a lot of the female coworkers, they always at your cubicle, man just begging you for attention. And I said, I want to know what, what your secret is. He said, you want to know what my secret is? I'll tell you my secret. <laughs> he kind of threw a mild insult at me. He said, my secret is I do just the opposite of what you do. I said, you do the opposite of what I do? I said, well, clarify, what is it that I do? He said, man, I've checked you out before. He said, man, you like to be like Mr. Funny Man with women. You like to crack jokes with them, you know, have them laughing. And, you know, you, you basically give them a lot of free attention. He said, I don't do that. And I said, what do you mean free? What, what, what do you mean by when you say free attention? And he said, he said, here's the thing, man. He said, I don't give women free attention. I don't give women free attention. He said, my, my principle is this. If me and a woman are not fucking or me and a woman are not doing business together and making money together, he said, man, I don't, I don't, I don't really talk to women, man. I just, particularly here at work, he said, I don't, I, I don't talk to them. He said, for what? And I ended up telling him, because I already kind of had that philosophy. Mine was more no small talk. Um, but as far as specifically the phrase free attention, he was the first one I heard that from. I said, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. And I ended up telling him, I said, oh, so you're saying just don't engage in, in small talk and fluff talk and that type of thing. He was like, yeah, basically, he said, man, he said, again, man, I can tell from your personality, you like to be entertaining with women you know, particularly on, on, on the lunch hour, when you don't go out for lunch and you stay in for lunch at your cubicle, all I see you doing is making the girls laugh, you know, cracking jokes and telling them humorous stories. He said, man, I don't do none of that shit. And I said, okay, all right. So you don't give women free, so no free attention. He was like, yeah, basically no free attention. And then I just carried that philosophy on. And uh, on a quick side note, I don't want to get into a digression about this, but when you're an author, 
as well as you know a YouTuber or some kind of podcaster. A lot of times people will just lift up off of you without giving you proper credit attribution. And mm-hmm. I would say more than any other talking point of mine, that's the number one signature phrase of philosophy. Now, I wouldn't say I created that, but I definitely, starting with the advent of the internet, I was the one who popularized that phrase of no free mm-hmm. attention. And then next thing I know, a whole bunch of other YouTubers and podcasts. Everybody's there. saying it. Yeah, everybody's saying, saying it. it. And uh, I got irritated. I'll be honest. I, I talk about that when people listen to, if they either <laughs> own the, the, the paperback or ebook version of no free attention, or when they hear the, in the introduction, I briefly talk about it. Like I'm talking about it now. I didn't, you know, now some guys have given me my credit, you know, they, they'll say, Hey, shout out to Alan Roger Curry. And I appreciate that. But there's other guys who try to make it seem like they came up with it. And I'm like, nah, bro. When nobody talking about no free attention before me. Question. I'm just keep my eye on the time. We have 10 minutes till we end. Are you, are you have a hard stop? Cause I'm happy to no, end it right we, there. We, or we, we can go, go over like another 10. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, what do you say to women who hear this conversation and they're thinking, well, that sounds pretty punitive, you know, um, this idea of not talking to me unless we're doing business together, unless we're having a sexual relationship? Well, I've had many discussions and I have gotten, you know, like a lot of women don't care for my, if I have one book that a lot of women don't care for is the possibility of sex. Mm-hmm. Um but, but mode one is, is popular with women. Yeah. And I wanted you to tell that. Maybe you can lead into that story when you say what you're going to say now with the lawyer who, you know, you met, you met at that party in Chicago who was kind of teasing you about writing this book about helping men get easy sex and that kind of thing. <laughs> like, I got to tell you, man, <laughs> I'm impressed by you, man. <laughs> you have your due you. diligence, man. <laughs> you are thorough, man. Thank I don't you. know if I've had too many people interview me that are as thorough as you. Um, yeah, my uh, I'll start with that story. Yeah, there was a woman, she was, my. I have a cousin who lives in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And he would always invite me to these uh, kind of upscale black professionals type parties was no not to sound pretentious, but there was no street element in her, in this person's parties. It was all, you know, black people were college educated, had careers as doctors, lawyers, corporate business people and, and, and the like. And, and the woman who was sponsored these parties, she was a well-respected attorney in Chicago named Kimberly. And so she came up to me. I was sitting outside of the, the party event, like kind of in the lobby. And she said, so you're Alan Roger Curry. I said, that would be me. She said, so you're so-and-so's cousin. I said, yes, indeed. That would be me. She said, I heard something about you and I want to know if it's true. I said, okay, what'd you hear? She said, your cousin told me you have an ebook called Mo One. And it's all about helping men get more pussy. And I said, really? Is, is that how my cousin <laughs> described it to you? She said, well, I don't know if he exactly used those words, but essentially that's how I surmise it was. She said, but you can tell me, am I wrong? She said, is your book about just helping men get more pussy because if so i think that's just so shallow and superficial i'm just so disappointed in you alan if that is true that you have an ebook about that i said well you would have to read it and inform your own opinion honestly i would like to think my ebook is more layered than that but here's here's the deal i'll make with you if i'll give you a complimentary copy of my ebook my mo one ebook if you read it and don't care for it, you can um, post, because she had like a like this amateur website where she would promote mm-hmm. her parties as well as her business. And I said, you can go on your website and essentially dog out my ebook if you feel like it's just trash. But I said on the flip side, if you read it and you find yourself liking the ebook, 
if you feel like it's more profound and layered than what you thought it was, you got to help me promote it. She said, that sounds fair. I said, okay. So I gave her about three weeks to read the uh, ebook. She read it in two nights and ended up just gushing over it. She wrote me one of the longest email, I think to this day, one of the longest emails I've ever received from a woman. And she just broke down like every chapter. And her summation was, she said, Alan, this, this book was way better than I thought it was going to be. It's way better. Even though I know you gear it towards men, she said, as a, as a woman, I found this book fascinating. And she said, I want to invite you to be a speaker at an upcoming event. And I said, sure, I'm down. And that ended up being my first co-ed speaking engagement. That was in January of 2006. And um, here's what was, and I know you probably heard this story a number of times. What was most disappointing, and it's been disappointing to this day, when I first wrote my book, I anticipated having a lot of female haters and critics and only an extremely small percentage of male haters and critics, but it's been just the opposite. I mean, I've had way more, particularly when it comes to my mall one book, I don't really have any notable female critics of my mall one. Again, the one book I, I received a lot of criticism from women is my book, The Possibility of Sex. Um, but Mo One, Who Said Again, women love those two books. But this co-ed speaking engagement that the attorney Kimberly sponsored, it was about 40 women, about 25 men. By the end of my speaking engagement, I had probably 95% of the women in favor of the Mo One approach. And even the 5% that had um, little reservations, it was mainly related to language, mm -hmm. which is you know, what I call my Mo One hardcore approach versus standard Mo One. But about uh, approximately a third of the men, man, they were hating on Mo One. They were just like, oh man, why are you trying to do this honesty thing, man? What's that about? Man, I had success lying to women and toying with their minds, man, manipulating them, man. What, what's with this, this straightforward honesty stuff, man? Yeah, me and one guy, we almost, we were probably about five minutes from coming to blows. We ended up getting into this intense argument. He kept calling himself the biggest player pimp in the city of Chicago. And I was like, if you're lying to women, you ain't no pimp, bro. You ain't no player, you're no pimp, man. And, uh, Yes, but um, you also don't believe in in um, getting women drunk. No, not at all. That's mo. That's mo three. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in using drugs or alcohol to get. Definitely, I would say probably really in general, but definitely if it's your very first time mm -hmm. having sex with a woman, no. Uh -uh. Matter of fact, I mean. If you studied the laws over the last 20 years, nowadays, that's essentially date rape. Mm. If you use drugs or alcohol to have sex with a woman for the first time, you put a woman in a position where she can say, I didn't, I wasn't in the right state of mind to consent, and she can charge you with date rape. That's why mm. this is another conversation for another day, but just to touch on it, see, this is why Mo, I mean, Mo, Me Too movement has been so tricky because. There's a lot of things in the 60s, 70s, and even early to mid 80s that used to be considered unethical, but they weren't illegal. Right. Whereas nowadays, those same things, for example, would be like giving a woman drugs or alcohol before you have sex with a woman. Nowadays, that's, that's extremely risky for a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't believe in that at all. I like, I, I only believe in having sex with women who have fully consented mm -hmm. to me having sex with them and that they're fully enthusiastic about me having sex with them. I'm not trying to trick a woman into having sex, coerce a woman into having sex, none of that. 
And you also say very clearly um, in all platforms, don't do this at work (laughs) (laughs) because you will get me too if you start talking like this at your office. Light, I tell you, I've gotten so much pushback from guys. It's it's surprising how much pushback I've gotten from guys. A lot of guys, there's a lot of guys who feel like in modern society that it's challenging to meet women away from it. Well, depending on how much you, you you know, if if you work in a conventional workplace versus working from home, and if you work a number of hours, a lot of guys argue that man, I don't really have a free time to meet women anywhere else but work. And I would be like, really? So you're telling me your workplace is literally your only place? And they pretty much, I mean, excluding, you know, match.com or online dating. That's the only place I work. Because I work, you know, some guys will say, man, I work like 60 hours a week, man. And, you know, that's where I come in contact with the most women. Um, But yeah, man, it's just too risky, man. But the Me Too movement era. And plus, you don't want to bring the drama of a casual relationship to the workplace, man. Not worth it. You also tell a story about this comedian several years ago who saw one of your presentations. He came up to you and he said something prophetic <laughs> about Mode One. Do you remember? Oh, uh, at the book signing event in California? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was having a book signing event in Ventura County, California. And this guy, his name was, I can't remember his last name. His name was Mark. Um, he had made at least one appearance, if not two appearances on Def Comedy Jam. And he said, uh, he said, Alan, I got your book. Read, no, he said, I read your book. He said, Alan, I read your book. I said, okay. I said, well, at first I said, that was quick. Yeah, so I was talking to Mark this comedian who had made appearances on Def Comedy Jam. And he said, Alan, I read your book. And I said, wow, that quick? Because he had just received the book, I want to say, on Thursday evening. And by Saturday afternoon, he had already finished it. Mm-hmm. And he said, Alan, I'm going to tell you something about your book, Mo One. <laughs> Excuse me. He said, society is not ready for this book right now i said really he said they're not ready man he said your book is probably at bare minimum at least 10 years ahead of its time and i'll say more so like maybe 15 to 20 years ahead of its time he said that's when i think society that was 2006 so yeah that was roughly about 15 years ago and uh yeah, he said, he said, but right now, he says, society not ready for more one, man. You, you going against the grains of social norms and conventions, man. And you, you're going to get a lot of pushback on this more one method you got. But he said about 10, 15, 20 years from now, he said, oh, yeah. He said, that's when I think society is going to be ready for more one. They're going to embrace it. They're probably going to encourage it. Mm-hmm. And something that you've talked about before, too, because you get pushed back on the language. You're saying you don't have to use the same language I use. This is just how I talk. And I don't want to speak in a different way from how I normally talk. So this is that's why I use the language that I use. But you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. It's just about being direct. Exactly. Exactly. Matter of fact, my brother. He came up with his own variation of Mo One. And he started calling it Mo 1.5. <laughs> And so I recommend that to a lot of clients. That's so yeah, I have three variations of Mo One. I get it just each. Mo 1.5 is when you're able to let a woman know either your romantic desires, interests, and intentions, or your strictly sexual desires, interests, and intentions without using any profanity or any sexually explicit language at all. Then one level up from that would be what I simply call standard Mo One. Standard mo one is when you would start off using tame language, but as the conversation unfolds, you escalate to using more provocative and explicit language. So mm-hmm. I might start off a conversation using PG, PG-13 language, but say maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes into the conversation, I'm using more R-rated language, X-rated language, or triple X-rated language. And in Mo One Hardcore, which is the most bold and most explicit, 
that's when you use R-rated, X-rated, or triple X-rated language within the first 90 seconds of the conversation. I would say over the course of my life, if I had to give rough estimates, I would say I've probably been more one hardcore with about 35% of the women I've approached. I've probably been standard mo one with about 60% of the women I've approached. And I've been mo 1.5 with about 5% of the women I've approached. Mm -hmm. I believe that most of my listeners are women. What would be, what have women sort of taken away from the mode one approach? And whether it's relating to their relationship or their marriage or just to casual dating, is there anything that they can adopt from the mode one approach or recognize about the mode one approach that can potentially benefit them or their um, dating dynamics? Oh man, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from women. Uh, I remember one of the first was when um, my paperback version first came out in uh, February of 2006. I had a woman from Atlanta that her review might still be on Amazon. I don't think she took it down. She, she wrote a review on Amazon that she ended up writing me an email. And she said, my Mo One book had totally transformed her social interactions with men. And mm -hmm. she basically sent me the message that, Alan, you shouldn't limit your Mo One philosophy to single heterosexual men. You should open it up to women too. Because she said, since I read your book, she said, this is what I do with men. Like, say I'm at a nightclub or social event and a guy approaches me and starts in, indulging me in small talk. I'll look that man directly in his eyes and say, do you really want to carry on this conversation with me? Or would you rather me just find some private area where I can pull down my panties so you can fuck me? And she said, so many men would be thrown off by that. Because I, I used imagine. to mention that I would leave a lot of women flustered and speechless. She said, mm -hmm. no, that works both ways, Alan. She said, I left a lot of men. They would be like, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 uh. you know, she said they, they wouldn't be able to handle her straightforward. But, and, and she said, that's how she would gauge guys. She said, assuming she, if she was talking to a guy that she was attracted to, if she was more one with them and they started getting flustered and speechless and fumbling over their words, she said she would lose interest and she would mm. end the conversation. Mm. That's fascinating. Last couple of questions. Um, why do you say you're not a pickup artist? Because I tend to distinguish. I know a lot of people use dating coach and pickup artist mm. uh, interchangeably. I don't. Here's my difference. A pickup artist, that term comes from a guy who was very good at going to like either a nightclub or a bar restaurant, meeting a woman and picking her up and taking her home. So basically it's number one, pickup artist centers around the des desire for short-term non-monogamous casual sex, usually like a one night stand, weekend fling. And even more specifically, it's about pulling women from either nightclub, bar, restaurant, even out on the streets and having what's known as a same-day seduction, a same-day seduction. That's where pickup artists, the term really derived from. Now you can say some pickup artists have expanded it, but really that's what a true pickup artist is. It's somebody mm -hmm. who can go out, say, on a Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Go to a club, social event, bar, restaurant, talk some stuff to her and get her to come home with her that night. Whereas a dating coach, that includes both advice for long-term relationships and casual sex and everything in between. And so that's why I've often said I don't consider myself a pick. Now, I've had some experiences that would fall under the pickup artist category. Like I've had same-day seductions. But when it comes to giving advice to my clients, I don't limit myself to just giving advice about going to a club or a bar or restaurant and picking up a woman. Mm -hmm. And you're relatively newly married. What does is, what is mode one look like in the context of a marriage? Oh, it's great, man. Me and my, my wife, we have a great relationship. 
sexually and non-sexually. Uh, we have a, a, a handsome little boy named Caden. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, our relationship is just very easy going. Like we, we, we never argue. And a lot of people find it hard to believe you know, some of my close friends, fraternity brothers, but we don't, that, that's not to say we haven't had what I would call minor respectful disagreements on certain things. But as far as like heated, or are we yelling at each other type arguments? Not one since we started dating. And uh, I love marriage. I love being a husband. I love being a father. I'll be honest, when I was younger, I didn't think I would like marriage as much as I do now. Um, but it's great, man. I, I love it to death. So you've now uh, given presentations and work with clients all over the world, Amsterdam, Atlanta, Berlin, London. Um, you're very much uh, in demand right now. You've got your Patreon platform. You've got your YouTube channel. You've got all of your books and um, there are lectures people can watch online and, and whatnot. Uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception about you and and what would you say your mission is at this point in your life at this point in your career my mission is just very simply to send out the message to men and women that you don't have to tell members of the opposite sex lies blatant lies or engage them in manipulative head games in order you know to have a satisfying relationship whether that's short-term long-term monogamous or non-monogamous i mean i think that's one of the things that's ruined the dating scene is just too much dishonesty too much disingenuous mm -hmm. misleading and manipulative behavior so for me some people you mentioned misconception some guys have this, the misconception that I'm about creating more prolific, highly promiscuous womanizers in society. No, that's not my mission. I'm not trying to make every guy I work with become more of a promiscuous ladies' man and womanizer. I'm about helping every man I work with become a more real, authentic, verbally bold, straightforwardly honest man with women about his true romantic and strictly sexual desires, interests, and intentions. And if they get rejected by being so real and authentic, so be it. Learn to accept rejection. I did. You know, and that's that's the main emphasis of my book, No Free Attention, in the, at least the first five chapters. That's the main theme of the first five chapters of that book, is that you have to learn how to accept the idea of getting rejected by women if they're not interested in sharing your company in any type of intimate manner. And, you know, um, so, yeah, I want to continue that mission because as long as there's dishonest, manipulative dating singles in the world, I'll be needed. <laughs> I love it. And then just a couple of reference points, um, two that I was familiar with before I even was I heard about you and your work was that scene in Vicky Cristina Barcelona, where Javier Bardem plays Juan Antonio, the, the misunderstood, mysterious artist. And he goes up to the two girls, Scarlett Johansson and the other girl, and he basically opens them with this very straightforward, direct approach. And I just, it always impressed me. I was like, I, I, something that I wish I had the, the balls to be able to do to someone. Um, and yeah, so it just, it just left an impression. And when I, when I heard you mention that, in your books and as a as an example a real world example of how it can look without using profanity and it's very classy and you know i think that's a good point of reference you also referenced the opening scene of four christmases which i also thought was um was uh was very very good too because just the whole the twist that happens at the end of that scene was really fun as well so mm -hmm. um can you list off the names of all of your books sure um mode one let the women know what you're really thinking mm -hmm. i have uh one paperback version of that book uh two ebook versions and a audiobook version of that book then i have another book 
called upfront and straightforward. Let the manipulative game players know what you're really thinking. That I have an ebook and paperback. In audiobook, that basically got absorbed into my Mode 1 audiobook. So really, when anyone purchases the Mode 1 audiobook, they're basically getting two books in one. That's why it's 13 hours. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. Mode 1 audiobook covers both Mode 1 paperback and upfront and straightforward paperback. Mm -hmm. um, next in line would be, Ooh, say it again, Mastering the Fine Art of Verbal Seduction and Oral, not oral, oral, A U R A L sex, basically, formal way of saying talking dirty. And that's an ebook, paperback, audiobook. That's actually my most popular audiobook among women. I mm. receive feedback from women almost on a monthly basis about who said again. They like the six verbal seduction stories in part two of the book. Um, then came the possibility of sex, how naive and lustful men are manipulated by women regularly. Uh, that came out in October 2012. I, I would say that's arguably I was mentioning earlier that a lot of people have bitten off of my stuff. Of all my books, I would have to say that's the number one book that people have bit off the most is the possibility mm -hmm. of sex. A lot, I mean, like a lot of guys have bitten off of that book. Um, yeah, that's in initially that was just an ebook and audiobook form. It was no paperback version. And that's what prompted me to rewrite it, which is now No Free Attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, No Free Attention is essentially an updated rewrite of the possibility of sex. And it started out, I just wanted to come out with a paperback version of the possibility of sex. But then as I began writing it, there's some chapters that are now totally different than the original. So it's almost, many people have told me, it's almost like a different book. Definitely in the first five chapters. In the, in the last five chapters, they're probably about 80 to 90% the same as the original. But in the first five chapters, I modified a lot of the content. Mm -hmm. And uh, that came out in November. Well, the ebook and paperback came out in late 2020. And again, the audiobook will be out May 1st of this year. And um, in 2016, I came out with the beta male revolution. While many men in today's society uh, are losing interest in marriage. And yeah, it just kind of, I start with the 1960s and come up to present day in that book and talk about how the dating, the, the, how the dating scene has evolved starting with 1960 with, to now is it's, with constant contraception and that kind of thing. Yeah. The birth control pill, the yeah. second wave of feminism, the mm -hmm. free love, sexual revolution, the legalization of abortion, all of that had a profound impact on how men and women interact with each other. I would say if I had to sum it up in, to one thing, that period between 1960 and the early to mid seventies, basically almost eliminated the stigma of engaging in pre both premarital sex and casual sex. Before 1960s, it was heavily frowned on for women to engage in premarital sex or casual sex. Sometimes their fathers would disown them if they found out they were engaging in premarital sex or casual sex. But by the mid seventies, Every woman felt comfortable engaging in pre, at minimum premarital sex, and in most cases, both premarital sex and casual sex. Um, so I think I've covered all my books. Yeah. Uh, are you are you writing another book, or are you just focusing on the ones that you have out now? Just focus on the ones now. I a lot of guys have requested. I've been involved in what's known as the BDSM lifestyle since I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. And I have elements of that, honestly, in my marriage. Mm -hmm. And so mo most people would be familiar with BDSM from the movie and the book, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, as well as a few right. other books and movies. But anyway, I have a lot of male clients that want me to write a book about being a BDSM dom. Mm -hmm. That's been requested, but I haven't made a decision on that book. So for right now, I would say I'm just concentrating on the books I have. 
Beautiful. And if I'm a guy and I'm listening to this conversation and I'm recognizing my tendency to be mode two or three or even four, obviously the first step is to read mode one. Mm -hmm. And then if I want more, what do I do? You would contact me. I would say, I would suggest you become a member of my patreon.com page. It's mm -hmm. patreon.com slash mode one, M-O-D-E-O-N-E. And then I have different tiers that give you access to different coaching, whether it's at the lowest level, email coaching. Then on top of that would be uh, coaching via Skype, Zoom, or telephone. I used to do one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face coaching, but I put that on pause. Because uh, you have a kid now. Well, a combination of both, the kid and the pandemic. The first thing was the pandemic. I, I That's when I put one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching on pause. And then more so, as you just mentioned, because combination of being married and having a son. Because mm -hmm. um, I used to, prior to the pandemic, I used to travel like every month. I was in the air right. traveling to some city to work with some clients. For one, That's my most expensive coaching is the one-on-one face-to-face -on -one coaching. But mm -hmm. I still do the email coaching and the Zoom slash Skype slash telephone coaching. Beautiful, man. Well, look, I want to wrap this up. Um, I want to loop back around to childhood. <laughs> okay. So I'm thinking about G.I. Joe and the Kung Fu Grip and you doing these voiceovers. <laughs> and what, what, what comes to mind, and, and this is something that I think, you know, you're obviously a master of, of oral seduction. Uh, you're in the BDSM thing, and you also have this this uh, mode one approach that 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 you are the you know the supreme master of that. But I would also say one thing I noticed just again as an author, I've done my own audiobooks. You do a fan freaking tastic audiobook, man. I mean, your voiceover is is it's amazing, and it almost sounds like you're just talking, like you're not even reading, you know, because a lot of times you're in these booths and you're reading your your words it, it it can come off like you're reading it a little bit but you just you just sound so seamless and so so natural and you got a wonderful voice so it's not surprising that you're you're you're, you're the godfather of oral seduction but uh, yeah i just wanted to, to point that out i really enjoy your audiobooks a lot so thank you so much for gifting us with with that well thank you thank you for that feedback I, that's very much appreciated uh I'm, I'm humbled by the, the kudos and, and respect. Are you reading it or are you just speaking these concepts? Oh, yeah, I'm usually, uh, well, what happens, I'll be honest, in the audio books, what I've typically done, most people will notice if they own both, like let's say the possibility of sex. If you own the ebook version of the possibility of sex, you'll notice that some things are at least a little bit different. Right. In, in, in the audio book version. And I would say that's probably, of all of my audiobooks, the one that probably comes closest to being word for word to the ebook and paperback version is the Beta Male Revolution. Mm -hmm. I read that one almost pretty much word for word. But Mo One, Who Said Again, and the Possibility of Sex, I would start off, say, reading a chapter, like, say, chapter five of a book. And then once I get into what I call a flow, I would just start speaking extemporaneously and I would deviate from the word for word, you know, content from the ebook and paperback. And so well, it that's worked. Why it, 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 it just like goes, yeah, and it works and it goes to show how when we do truly find our calling, you know, we end up incorporating everything from our, from our life experience. And, you know, you have your acting experience where I'm sure you had to do a little bit of that improvisation and, and speaking ex extemporaneously and, and, uh, and yeah, you just, it's like you're bringing everything together. That's why I like to start off in the early years and work our way up so people can see how all of it just kind of ties together. And I just want to acknowledge you, man, for, um, for taking the leaps of faith you had to take to, to find your, your path and to, to dedicate yourself to this mission that you're on. And uh, I truly do think the world is going to be a better place for it, for people just being direct and people being honest and people not trying to get other people drunk and whatnot in order to, you know, to have, to do what humans do. That's just, if we're being completely 100 about it, that's just what we do. We want, 
You know, it's not all about being married. Some people just want to have casual affairs and sex and whatnot. And so why not just speak openly and honestly about it and save everybody a lot of time? So thank you very much. And, and thanks for, for having this conversation with me. Thank you for having me, Light. And I want to say to you, man, you are definitely one of the most intelligent, articulate, and uh, just an excellent and very thorough interviewer. It's refreshing. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I wish you nothing but continued success in the future. I'm gonna have to stay in contact with you, man. You, you know. If you like that video, you're gonna love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.